Good morning. Welcome to worship. On this third Sunday in Lent, we are glad you're here. Um, I appreciate that people are spread <laughs> on all three sections of the uh, space and on Zoom this morning. So uh, thank you for using the space and being present. This is the time when we usually share announcements. Are there people in the room who have announcements to share? I hope you're all staying for the potluck lunch. The pilgrims returned, and I'm still feeling excited about the trip, so I hope you will come and hear from more of the pilgrims. And even if you didn't bring something for potluck, there's plenty of food. Is there anyone on Zoom who has an announcement to share? I didn't get a complete bulletin apparently this morning, so I'm pretty sure that there are America for Christ offering envelopes in the bulletin. Is that correct? There is a flyer about the offering and envelopes. <laughs> Quality control on the bulletin. Some people got envelopes, some people got inserts. Uh, the point is that we are receiving that offering uh, this month, and, and one important thing to note about that offering is that the money um, goes to American Baptist Home Mission Society, but a portion of the total offering comes back to the region for a regional ministry. So it is um, the only offering that this is true, the only one of our special offerings that this is true about, that there's actually a little bit of benefit to us um, in, in giving our money. So I would invite you uh, to take that envelope and use it or to give online. And um, if you give online, make sure you, you check on the drop-down menu, America for Christ offering. Also, I would invite you to read that insert, those of you who are fortunate enough to get one in your bulletin, uh, because on one side is information about the offering, and on the other side is information about our cover art today, and it actually happens to mention um, something that ties in with the pilgrimage. So I would encourage you to look at that as you are able. Today we are welcoming Gerardo Marty to our pulpit and our fellowship. Dr. Marty is a sociologist of religion and professor at Davidson University in North Carolina. His academic interests are in race, religion, and social change. He is one of the three sociologists who are part of the research that is happening in conjunction with the Alliance of Baptist Thrive Project that we're part of. Gerardo is a sought after speaker and author he has written several books. I'm not going to name all of them for you, but two that I think are, uh, might have particular connectivity to Emmanuel are these. One is called The Deconstructed Church, Understanding Emerging Christianity. And the other one, published in 2020, is American Blind Spot, Race, Class, Religion, and the Trump Presidency. Many of us have met with Gerardo in Zoom spaces, and G G Gerardo, we're delighted that you are with us in person today, and we look forward to the sermon that you'll bring. Friends, let us worship together.
Join me in the call to worship. Again and again. Again and again. Again and again. And again and again. We are met. We are shown the way. Today's scripture comes from the second chapter in John. And I'm reading from the message. When the Passover feast, celebrated each spring by the Jews, was about to take place, Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem. He found the temple teeming with people selling cattle and sheep and doves. The loan sharks were also there in full strength. Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and the cattle, upending the tables of the loan sharks, spilling coins left and right. He told the dove merchants, get your things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. That's when the disciples remembered the scripture, zeal from your house consumes me. At this time, all of our children and youth are invited to go uh, to faith formation with Beth. You'll be meeting in the parlor. Um, so this is anybody from uh, preschool up through high school is welcome to join in that. And it will not affect your participation in sharing about the pilgrimage, because that was a question that I was asked earlier. 
person makes about 35,000 choices in a day. 35,000 choices each and every day. So in this prayer of confession, we pause to take a moment to think and to ask how many of our decisions are choices that God would have us make? How many are not? So let us pray together, knowing that we need guidance and trusting that even if we fail, God is showing us the way. God of justice, we are guilty of building tables. God of justice, we are guilty of forgetting where we are. God of justice, we are guilty of ignoring the point. God of our hearts, draw near to our choices. And as you do, The good news is that God took on flesh and walked this earth to show us the way. God took on flesh so that we could see what it looks like to disrupt overturned systems of corruption. God took on flesh to teach us another way. God took on flesh to point us to restoration. God took on flesh so that we might be forgiven. Friends, we are held, loved, and forgiven by a just and merciful God. Thanks be to God for a love like that.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. The head of the Justice Committee, a black woman, was researching the history of her Baptist church. In the process, she uncovered the story of John Thomas. Now, John Thomas was the janitor of the church. Described as kind and humble, he served the church for 35 years. And although he attended church every Sunday, no one who came would ever know it. See, John Thomas was African American. And because of segregation, John Thomas was not allowed to sit in the sanctuary. And so every Sunday, John Thomas was forced to sit in the baptistry above the choir loft. Every Sunday, as members and attenders went about worshiping God, growing in God, serving God, they didn't know that there was a hidden seat in the baptistry. Every Sunday, a black man worshiped with them too, but at a discreet distance and hidden from view. According to family members contacted, this exclusion was a sadness to John Thomas, a suffering largely unacknowledged and unknown. Every Sunday, the injustice of segregation was present at the heart of their own church, and the people in the pew could not see it. Certainly, the pastors and the staff of the church knew, but the leaders didn't acknowledge him. They didn't let people know, and they did nothing to change it. At the end of his life, John Thomas made his impact on the church in an even amazing way he could not have anticipated. In 1959, the church held a memorial service for him in the sanctuary, the same sanctuary that he himself had not been allowed to sit. Over a thousand people came. Black people and white people came together in common worship, sitting in the same service. In fact, his funeral was the first semi-integrated service in the history of the congregation, and one of the first in the Fort Worth area. But even then, racism remained at the center of the church. Black newspapers reported that black and white people sat on separate sides of the sanctuary. The racial divide held firm. In partnership with the family, Broadway Baptist Church recently committed to honoring John Thomas with a plaque and a portrait, a public recognition of his presence that he was denied while he, was lived, while he lived. Their acknowledgement as a congregation is an act of repair. The leadership of the church spearheaded by a black volunteer she is cleansing the temple of God. Now in a passage usually under the heading, Jesus cleanses the temple, we read about Jesus during the time of Passover using a whip of cords driving people out of the temple. Centuries of biblical commentary unpack the social political system that created the sacrificial industry of the first century that was boldly confronted by Jesus. It happened in a time and place far from our own experience, but really the story is a little scary. After all, weren't all these people doing the right thing? Didn't God expect us to go to temple doing our acts of worship? Didn't spiritual leaders provide us the building, prepare the rituals and activities for us to participate? Didn't they make everything more convenient, allowing people to fulfill their worship given their time and resources, and they had it all right there inside the temple. But then an extraordinary man comes, bearing the authority of God in ways never before seen, takes a whip, a whip and boldly clears everyone out because something was deeply wrong. So wrong, he said that their utterly profane human actions had defiled the house of God a holy place, but a place with injustice at its center. Little did those devoted pilgrims know. We might think, wow, Jesus really got those hypocrites. And yet, the point of the story is far more profound than we usually read in our Bible commentaries or hear from our pulpits 
the confrontation of Jesus revealed something that was right there but remained hidden. It was there if you looked, but their routine worship of God kept it hidden from view. Had you and I been one of those pilgrims, we could not have seen the working of a system of oppression, of exploitation, of privilege, of power, a system sanctioned by spiritual leaders, and ironically, a system facilitated by our devotion to God, our commitment to God. Like those temple pilgrims, we also live in a time when our own churches are also embedded in systems of power, oppression, and exploitation. The cleansing of the temple is not intended to be a single, once-for-all event. Jesus modeled something that's still relevant for us today, because it's our task to continue confronting injustice in our holy places. And with so much confusion and misinformation, defensiveness and distortion, it is just as difficult for us to understand the injustice that remains in our sanctuaries as it was for the naive Passover pilgrims in the temple courts of Jerusalem. What injustice remains hidden in our holy places? As the lead co-director of the Thrive Project, I'm so glad that Emmanuel has joined with churches across the United States and Canada who also declare themselves to be working toward racial justice. And as we continue to learn together, we know this, racial justice is difficult work. It's difficult mostly because it involves revealing injustices that are present in our own congregations. Rather than presuming to the work of anti-racism out there, churches over and over again tell us that they are caught up in first doing the work in here. Like a gay woman pastor who revealed the challenge of cleansing the temple, she said, our church has this idea about ourselves that I think is mostly accurate, but I know there are these places we don't see ourselves clearly. I'm afraid it's true. We do this work with becoming anti-racist, and we just fall back on all the stories of how we've done these wonderful things in the past, and we're not looking at our own internalized racism today where and how we've acted on that, and how we are racist still. The work of racial justice is hard, and it is so tempting to try easy solutions. A white Baptist pastor of a very progressive church said his church was told that all they needed to do was hire a black staff member, and the racial climate of the church would change. And so they did. They hired a black person. And after she left the church, she revealed how hurt she was by the church. But she agreed to come back to share what it was like, in her words, to be your token black staff member. The pastor who invited her back said it was part of educating ourselves. Just that because we say we're open to black people doesn't mean we're really that progressive. And in her willingness to speak, she is cleansing the temple. I've heard a lot of stories. Pastors and members say they want black people in the church. We want them, we love them, but we also expect them to help us with our racism. We expect them to be part of revealing the injustice in our holy place, and that is difficult. A black pastor said that to be a person of color in a predominantly white congregation is in itself doing the work of anti-racism. It's lonely, she said. The fact is the number of black people in our white Baptist congregations are so small that they bear the burden of much anti-racism work even if they don't want to. As one black woman said, being black in any white dominant institution, you're going to be the DEI representative in so many ways, it gets to be a lot. A black man who agreed to be interviewed said, my pastor asked me if I would be involved, and I had a particularly hard time. In fact, initially, I said no. I wouldn't do it because it's very difficult opening up and discussing this in any kind of frank and honest manner. This is something I've spent a good portion of my life repressing 
and holding back. To actually voice this is like opening a wound again, and it's not something I really do comfortably or with joy. But, he said, I'll do my best to be honest and forthcoming. Across history, people of color like him have been working to cleanse the temple, yet it never happens without pain. A black gay man said, the church disappointed me. He said, as I began to meet individuals, I began to realize, ah, they're racist in this congregation. They say they're not. They just don't know. They've never been in a situation where they've been challenged. And in his challenge to his church, he is cleansing the temple. Similarly, a black woman, a member of our church for quite a while, said, I feel like I have to educate people. I just, you get tired trying to explain to people in a nice, gentle way where their assumptions went wrong. She saw herself as being of service to others, and she was so gracious. She described her church as a family. We're trying to help each other and help the family do better. This black woman, she is cleansing the temple. A white gay man was asked about his church, and he spoke about it with such high praise, a loving church, a sense of belonging. And at one point, he said, race is not an issue for us. Frankly, the confidence in this white person was jarring. Race is not an issue for us. But how do black people in the same church feel? A black woman in the same church said, there are so many people who call themselves allies and all post Black Lives Matter and say things like that. In our church, they do try their best, she said. I don't think they're aware. Like when new people come with kids in the church, people invite them to their house to use the pool. But it took months before we ever received an invitation. I get disappointed because our church is a place where when they know better, they do better. So if I brought it up, I know they would be super sad. It doesn't erase the fact that it happened, so it's just disappointment. The same woman helped her church craft a statement to say Black Lives Matter, but it became a debate. Some white members felt, don't all lives matter? So she wrote a letter to the deacon board, and they did tell her Thanks for telling us about this and educating us. But she said, I was really scared to send it. But I thought they should know, especially with what was going on in the world and what they just put me through was traumatic. It was like you asked for free labor, which I gave freely because I enjoy the people here. I have a good experience here. But they didn't realize the trauma they put me through. In her letter to the church, she was cleansing the temple. A black woman in another congregation told me about her willingness to have difficult conversations. She said, I don't have time for all this pussyfooting around. No, we're going to have the conversation. That's my thing. We're not walking on eggshells anymore. I'm done with that. Let's make a safe space to have that conversation in her willingness to have frank conversations in the church. This black woman is cleansing the temple. One of our black Baptist pastors in a predominantly white church said, this congregation knows a lot, which is true, but they also think they know a lot. Wow. <laughs> they get complacent and say, we've done it. We know it. We're good. They feel they get it, and that's enough, but it's not enough. There's so much more to know, to learn, to grow. A white woman in yet another church said, really well-meaning, loving people would be horrified to find out that they don't see what's in front of them. I feel the need to raise that awareness, to make us see people who don't look exactly like us and really see how they experience the world, how they experience white people, how they experience white institutions and interactions with government, schools, with medicine and faith. We're horrified to know that we're participating in that, are caught up in that, 
and it comes in all kinds of flavors. And there's willful ignorance, and there's denial. There's all kinds of things rolled into that. And listen to her words. She said, the biggest role I see for myself is to admit my own complicity, admit my own struggles, admit the fact that you don't have to be a horrible person to be racist. That's really hard for us. For a lot of people, they push away any conception that anything I could do could be racist, or anything I do couldn't be racist. But my experiences made me say, not you're racist, but we're racist. Me too. Me too. What is the racial injustice that remains to be cleansed in this holy place? A white pastor in the South said the church has the language for what's needed, right? I mean, we have the language of reconciliation. We have confession. We have repentance and transformation. We can name it. We can expose people to ideas and voices that help us understand the world as it is. We can talk about the church and how race plays out in our churches, about the shortcomings and the failures of the church. We can model what repentance can look like. We understand that it's in this process that we claim to understand. Today, the white church confronting racism might be the most powerful way that we have to experience the fullness of the gospel. A white woman said, in many ways, our church is more cutting edge and has become more comfortable and has taken risks that some other churches haven't. But it doesn't mean that we're there yet. We can do better. I know there are racist tendencies that I can't see within myself. And that's where I need friends who can gently hold me accountable and say, did you hear what you just said? I love you, I really do. But did you hear what you just said? That's my word of caution to our church, to me, to you, to our churches. It is and always will be some of the most important work that we need to continue to live into, and I'm at the starting line. She's at the starting line of cleansing the temple. A black gay man, a leader in his church said, we've got a long road ahead of us and a lot of work to do. We're by no means done. With us and with all the other churches, we have to have the grace to know that yes, we're going to have failures along the way. We're going to fumble. We're going to make mistakes, but not to get bogged down and realize that we can learn from it and to continue to move forward. Let's be honest with ourselves that this work is going to take time and we'll get there. Friends, may God help us in the continual work of cleansing the temple of God. Thank you, Gerardo. As we prepare to share communion, I would invite us to rise in body and spirit and sing, let us break bread together.
be seated. That hymn we've just been singing is an African-American spiritual that finds its roots in 19th century Virginia or South Carolina. It is an invitation to come together in worship and more specifically in sharing the Lord's Supper together. Now, we don't generally celebrate communion on our knees. We receive the elements from the comfort of our chairs or sometimes by forming a line at the front for intinction. And most people would argue that the physical posture we take isn't as important as the posture of our heart. But posture is less important when we have the ability, the privilege, to choose it. For those of us who can't walk up and receive the elements, it's not about comfort, but about practicality that we sit. And for many of us, if we were to kneel, we would need help getting back up. But no one forces us to kneel or to bow down not here in this sanctuary and not in other places in our lives. But that wasn't true for those who first sang those words, let us break bread together on our knees. The choice of whether they sat or stood or knelt or fell down was not their own. Their bodies did not belong to them. Their freedom to gather as we do was only at the discretion and will of others. And still, they gathered, they chose to. And by their own will, they fell on their knees to receive the bread and the cup and the promise of redemption that eluded them in everyday life. With humility, Lord have mercy on me, they turned to the rising sun knowing that salvation was true even in the midst of enslavement and oppression. Let us give thanks. God who redeemed your people Israel from slavery and oppression, you continue to hear the cries of the suffering and remember your covenant. Your loving kindness remains true from generation to generation. God for your faithfulness we give thanks. Jesus, who redeems our lives from the grip of death, you continue to save your people. Having set aside your privilege to walk with us in the messiness of the human condition, we would follow your example. 
You showed that power is not about oppression, but liberation. Jesus, for your love we give thanks. Holy Spirit, who redeems the secular within us to make it sacred, you continue to work within us and the Church Universal to bring justice to the world. You both encourage and convict us in truth. Spirit, for your advocacy, we give you thanks. As you have in the past and will do until time ends, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make this cup and this loaf more than what we set on the table. May they become the reality of our hope in you, our communion with Christ, and with one another. Amen. We do this again and again, as has been done in homes, and secret rooms, castles, and high cathedrals, in pews and catacombs, at, nailing, at kneeling rails, knowing that every time we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until the day he comes again. So at this table, we remember that on the night that he was to be betrayed among friends gathered around a table, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and gave thanks and he broke it and he said this is my body it is broken for you In order to be shared, the loaf must be broken. If it, does, if it is not, it does not fulfill its promise. And so we receive the broken bread and give thanks, for in its brokenness we find wholeness. Take and eat. And after supper, Jesus took a cup 
And he said, this is the cup which is poured out for you and for all, the new covenant, the new relationship between God and all creation. Do this in remembrance of me. The cup, too, must be poured. One vessel is emptied so that another might be filled. And from the cup we share the juice, for in the pouring out we find grace. Take and drink. will find baskets for your empty cups at the end of the rows. Let us pray together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church, all leaders and ministers and all your people. We pray for our nation, for all the nations of the earth and for all who govern and judge. Especially we hold before you Israel, Palestine, Especially we hold before you the delegations of Christians from the United States who are there right now, bearing witness, offering encouragement, sharing the suffering. O oh God of life and love and peace, we pray that weapons of war would be laid down, that walls of separation be dismantled, that prisoners be released, that enmity and hatred give way to understanding, that calls for revenge and violence will grow silent, and that those in authority might find ways to work together for the good of all people. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, those who cry out for justice, 
those who live under the threat of terror, and those without a place to lay their head. We pray for those who are ill, those who are in pain, those under stress, and those who are lonely. And we hold before you in these moments, God, those for whom we have deep and personal concerns. Holy One, in Jesus Christ, you have built for us an eternal house, a temple of righteousness, a place of gracious plenty for the hungry and abundant life for the poor in spirit. Fill us, God, with zeal for the body of Christ. Overturn the tables of corruption and greed and ignorance and upset the imbalance of injustice so that we may worship you and serve you in spirit and truth. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trial too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Friends, I would invite you uh, as you have already been invited, but I will repeat that uh, there is a potluck awaiting us and stories from pilgrimage. So when the uh, postlude is over, I would encourage you to make your way into Fellowship Hall for that good time. But now I would invite you to stand in body or spirit as we sing The Lord Now Sends Us Forth.
friends, as you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk, march, run toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen.